Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about inflammatory diseases of the central nervous system in pediatric patients. Inflammatory diseases that affect the central nervous system can be limited to specific locations within the nervous system or can affect several areas. The inflammation of the membranes that are covering the brain is called meningitis. The inflammation of the brain is called encephalitis. A localized limited infection is called abscess or granuloma. The inflammation can be caused by different pathogens as bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi and others. Let's start with talking about meningitis in children. As we said, it is the inflammation of the membranes covering the brain. It develops usually in the subarachnoid space and affects the soft membranes, which are the pia mater and arachnoidea, which together make up the leptomeninges. The dura mater, the heart membrane, is usually not inflamed. 70% of cases occur in children below the age of 5. The incidence is the highest in the first two years of life. It is one of the most common pediatric inflammatory diseases in non-industrialized countries. Meningitis can be divided into acute and chronic. Acute meningitis is usually viral or bacterial, while chronic meningitis is usually caused by tuberculosis, syphilis, fungi or parasites. Depending on the type of the inflammatory exudate, meningitis can be divided into serous, usually in the case of viral meningitis, fibrinous, as in tuberculosis, purulent, iatrogenic by a lumbar puncture with pure sterility, or hemorrhagic, as by influenza or anthrax. Purulent meningitis is caused, among others, by Neisseria meningitidis, pneumococci, staphylococci, hemophilus influenza, and also Escherichia coli, pseudomonas, plebsiella, and listeria. It is mainly characterized by pus collections over the hemispheres of the brain. Other bacterial agents include tuberculosis, syphilis, leptospirosis and brucellosis. The viral meningitis is often an accompanying disease to a general systemic infection. That's why it is often caused as a secondary meningitis. It is mainly caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. The non-bacterial meningitis is by viruses as the virus of the family Flaviviridae that causes the tick-borne encephalitis, herpes virus, enterovirus, mumps virus or fungi as Cryptococcus neoformans. Usually the pathogens are getting entry to the body via the respiratory tract or in another way into the bloodstream. Via the blood-brain barrier, they can pass into the brain. In the case of pseudomegalovirus, enteroviruses, or the Epstein-Barr virus, they usually reach the brain through the bloodstream. Viruses as the herpes simplex virus, rabies, or the poliovirus reach the brain by traveling retrogradely along the nerves. The changes in the nervous system are either by the exotoxins of the pathogen or by the reaction of the immune system, which often produce cytokines that destroy nerve cells. Also sometimes the blood-brain barrier is destroyed, which leads to edema and increased intracranial pressure. Enteroviruses are one of the most frequent causative agents of viral or serous meningitis in children. They cause around 50% of viral meningitis. This group includes the Coxsackie virus A and B, the echovirus and poliovirus. The clinical manifestation of meningitis is often nonspecific, but there are a few hallmarks we will talk about. Typical nonspecific symptoms are fever, severe headache, nausea and vomiting. Later on often drowsiness, confusion, stiffness of the neck, Seizures and non blanching rash, photophobia, and tachypnea develop. The typical physical examination 
is done by checking for the Kernix and Brodzinski sign. In the Kernix sign, the knee is extended on a flexed hip in a right angle with a restriction by pain over 135 degree. In the Brodzinski sign, there is a severe neck stiffness which causes the hips and knees of the patient to flex when the neck is elevated. Other diagnostic measures include a MRI and CT of the skull as well as a lumbar puncture. In the lumbar puncture or alternatively a blood culture, bacteria can be cultivated. Often cultured bacteria include pneumococci, Neisseria meningitidis, E. coli and Haemophilus influenzae. The cerebrospinal fluid also usually shows pleocytosis, so rapid transient increase of white blood cells, followed by lymphocytosis and also a slight increase in proteins. In the case of a bacterial meningitis, the glucose in the CSF will be reduced as bacteria consume it. The therapy of meningitis occurs usually by hospitalization, where first the vital signs are checked. After that should immediately be given a high-dose intravenous antibiotic and intravenous dexamethasone to suppress the inflammation. Often used antibiotics for Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumonia and Haemophilus influenzae are ceftriaxone or cefotaxime. For Listeria, ampicillin is added. For Enterobacteria, Pseudomonas and Staphylococci, Vancomycin or metronidazole can be used. For viral meningitis, antivirals as acyclovir can be used. Also sometimes anticonvulsants may be added if necessary, as well as a low molecular heparin, as clexine, is given to prevent a thrombosis. In the lumbar puncture, there are a few points indicating that the patient has a bacterial meningitis. I want to emphasize this again because it is especially important for the treatment as a viral meningitis is often self-limited but a bacterial meningitis can be very dangerous and has to be treated with antibiotics. If in the lumbar puncture a cell count over 300 is found, it indicates the presence of bacteria. Also a granulocyte count over 70% a protein level of over 40 mg per deciliter and glucose under 30 mg per deciliter speaks for a bacterial meningitis. Bacteria utilize glucose, keep that in mind. Therefore, the levels are lower than in the case of a viral meningitis. Now we will talk shortly about lymphocytic choreomeningitis. It is commonly caused by the Armstrong Lilly virus. The transmission is usually by air droplets and the oral route. The pathogen has its natural reservoir in rodents and is not given further between humans. Disinfection is rare, making up around 1% of all viral meningitis cases. The virus colonizes in the choroid plexus, where the CSF is produced and causes a hypersecretion. The clinical presentation occurs in two phases. First the flu-like phase, after that the meningitis phase. Some patients may have diarrhea and otherwise fever, myalgia and arthralgia. The symptoms of meningitis develop usually around one week after the onset of symptoms. Cranial nerve lesions and psychiatric symptoms are common which can include psychomotor agitation or psychosis. The diagnosis is done by blood culture and PCR. In the next part, we will talk about encephalitis and encephalomyelitis. It is the inflammation of the cerebrum and in the case of encephalomyelitis, also the spinal cord and membranes of the brain. Rarely it only affects a certain area of the brain as for example only the cerebellum. It can be classified by different principles as by the etiology, pathomorphology, brain involvement or the course of the disease. The etiological classification is usually the most important as it determines the treatment. Depending on the type of damaged brain matter, 
we can differentiate polioencephalitis, which affects only the gray matter, leukoencephalitis, which affects the white matter, or panencephalitis, which involves both types of tissue. Etiologically, we differentiate viral encephalitis, bacterial encephalitis, or fungal or parasitic. It is usually further investigated and specified. Encephalitis can also be either primary or secondary, depending on if other organs or systems are affected first. According to the course of the disease, we can differentiate acute, subacute and chronic courses of encephalitis. The clinical picture is usually a combination of constitutional symptoms of an infection and symptoms of the encephalitis syndrome. The encephalitis syndrome combines the occurrence of disturbances in the brain, brainstem, cerebellum and spinal cord. Signs for a focal neurological deficit include a central paresis or paralysis and sensory disorders which occur due to damage to the cranial nerves. This syndrome is never missing. I know we should usually not say never or always in medicine, so take it with a grain of salt, but basically it would be extremely surprising if a patient with encephalitis would not have focal neurological deficit. Hypertensive symptoms are related to cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure. Symptoms for this syndrome are headache, vomiting, bradycardia and alteration in consciousness. Psychiatric symptoms include psychomotor agitation and delirious symptoms. These symptoms are very common. The mortality for encephalitis is between 5 and 20% in patients with a viral encephalitis, depending on the exact virus. Also residual symptoms, such as a mental deficit, speech disorder or residual paresis, is found in around 20% of patients. Now we will talk about acute primary viral polioencephalitis. This is an infection caused by the poliovirus in the group of enteroviruses which typically affects the motor neurons in the anterior horns of the spinal cord and the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves in the brainstem. Polioencephalitis is characterized by causing an asymmetric muscle palsy and paralysis. It is very common in earlier decades, but since the mass vaccination program, it is rather rare. For example, in the US, there are annually around 15 cases divided around equally among unvaccinated children and adults. Infections are the most common in summer months and in children it usually affects the age group of 1 to 5 years. The virus multiplies in the pharynx and intestinal tract. Only in some patients the virus gets into the nervous system. The disease usually affects the gray matter of the anterior and lateral horns of the spinal cord as well as the motor course of the facial, vagus, glossopharyngeal and hypoglossal cranial nerves. The incubation period is around 1 to 3 weeks and the infection can pass with the development of immunity without any symptoms or it can cause a mild general infection without neurological symptoms. These two types make up around 95% of infections. Only in around 5% of patients, a fulminant disease occurs. It occurs with fever and general cerebral symptoms, as headache, meningeal symptoms and peripheral paralysis. The disease is divided into six stages. First, a flu-like viremia. After that, an apparent healing stage, with one to two days of improvement of symptoms, before it goes over into the third stage, which is the parapyretic stage with meningeal syndrome. After that follows the paralytic stage, then the recovery stage, and lastly the residual stage. The clinical forms of poliomyelitis can be divided into the paralytic forms that include the spinal, bulbar, pontine and encephalitic forms and the aparalytic forms 
that include the visceral and meningeal forms. The diagnosis is done in different steps. One option is to isolate the virus from samples of fecal or nasal passages. Difficult to diagnose are the cases where polio occurs without paralysis or dose with only a unilateral facial paralysis. Medications that are used in the treatment include antipyretics and vitamin B and E. Also corticosteroids with anti-inflammatory and anti-edemal effect are used. The recovery is usually accompanied by physical therapy and sometimes corrective orthopedic operations. Other causes of encephalitis are the measles encephalitis, influenza encephalitis and HSV encephalitis after a herpes infection. Viruses are generally the most common cause for encephalitis in children and vaccines are available for measles, mumps, rubella and chickenpox which have lowered the incidence of encephalitis cases in children drastically. Typical for most cases of encephalitis, regardless the causative agent, are sudden high fever, photophobia, opistotonus, vegetative disorders as bradycardia, and alteration of the mental status, and consciousness and seizures. Depending on the localization of the inflammation, also paresis, visual disturbances and other neurological dis disturbances can occur. In the differential diagnosis, brain tumors or abscesses, subarachnoidal hemorrhage and intoxications should be considered. Possible complications are brain edema, which should be treated with mannitol and a diffusely spreading of the inflammation. As a late complication, the post-encephalitic syndrome can occur, in which permanent changes of the personality and behavior can occur. It leads to clinical Parkinsonism and is often caused by the degeneration of nerves in the substantia nigra. If the encephalitis is suspected to be of viral origin, aciclovir can be given. If it is suspected to be of bacterial origin, High doses of antibiotics that can pass the blood-brain barrier are given, usually intravenously. Also corticosteroids and mannitol are often given to reduce the inflammation and brain edema. Anticonvulsants might be given if a child experiences seizures. Now I would like to talk lastly about primary CNS vasculitis or primary angiitis of the CNS. In the recent years, it is the most common cause of neurological deficits acquired after birth in children. It is due to the inflammation of blood vessels in the brain of a child and causes stroke-like symptoms, seizures and headache. If large vessels are affected, hemiparesis can occur. If smaller vessels are affected, the symptoms are often milder as a fine motor deficit psychiatric symptoms as a psychosis or headache. The cause is unknown, but it seems to be linked to a prior varicella infection or another underlying systemic disease. The diagnosis is usually made by making an MRI and CT scan of the brain to visualize the vessel walls and to see if there is an inflammation in the wall of the vessels. Also an angiography can be done and can be more specific than an MRI if small vessels are affected. In a lumbar puncture, often a higher pressure, elevated leukocytes and proteins can be found. Also a brain biopsy for the confirmation of the diagnosis can be done. If a brain biopsy should be done, it is recommended to do it before the administration of corticosteroids, as this might change the histology. The treatment includes anticoagulants and immunosuppressants and sometimes anticonvulsants and antipsychotics depending on the symptoms of the patient. That's it for the video. Thank you for watching and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much.